Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the On It, Not In It interview series podcast. I'm your host, Todd Eppert, and today I'm joined by Rob Herman, who is the managing principal of the 4100 Group Financial Services, or 4100 FS. Rob, thank you so much for joining us. Would you like to kick us off with a brief background as to who you are and what you do? Absolutely, Todd. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for the invite and glad to uh, glad to get going. So my background, uh, we we were talking uh, prior about uh, I'm a Cincinnati boy who went to the University of Michigan, still secretly a, a, an Ohio State fan, except when they play Michigan. Uh, I ended up going to graduate school at Northwestern, the business school there, Kellogg. After that, I worked on Wall Street for a time as a sell side analyst and later as a hedge fund analyst before being a principal at an asset management firm. That firm um, ended up being acquired by Greece Financial Partners, which we mentioned the 4100 Group Financial Services. Greece Financial Partners is a portfolio company of the 4100 Group Financial Services. It's a registered investment advisor. And the 4100 Group Financial Services, which I now have oversight, uh, responsibilities for um, is in four primary verticals, wealth management, multifamily office, which is really ultra high net worth investment services, um, all the things that come with small institutions and, and significant uh, complexities of, of, of wealth. Um, usually it's um, $100 million and above in terms of assets under advisement. The third group is is asset management, and then a fourth header, which supports wealth management and the entire ecosystem of 400FS. Ancillary services can include accounting, um, trust services, uh, other fintech, financial technology platforms, and things like that. So collectively, it's kind of a bespoke platform. We invest in these companies. We support their growth. We're both permanent and patient capital. Um, so a, a bit of a different approach than what you generally see in terms of the M&A space for financial services, um, but we're off and running. And I think the, the key is providing from a business to business and a business to consumer perspective, bespoke best in class service intensity. Awesome. Thank you for the clarity. And that's great. And I think some of our listeners would love to learn a little bit more about what this these family groups are and things like that that you're talking about is in your four arms. So I think this would be a great podcast to learn more about what you guys do and how you serve your clients and, and then what you're looking to do. But let me start at the beginning uh, of one of the best, best questions I like to ask. So um, you, did, you did work a little bit in the kind of the, I'll call it the W2 world, but it sounds like you've always had a bit of an entrepreneurial uh, energy behind what you're doing, you know, small, you know, bit company related, you're managing assets for people. So what, what was the spark behind that? What, what made you say, hey, I want to be an entrepreneur, really, not just a W-2 guy? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Todd. Early in my career, I cut my teeth at, at large firms, for example, Goldman Sachs. And while it was a great experience in terms of learning, I think you're a cog in a machine and everybody has their own path. Some people like working for large companies and can make a real impact. But what I found in terms of impact in my interest level I like to sometimes color outside the lines and, and uh, as I'm sure many entrepreneurs do. And so becoming part of Greece Financial Partners, which I joined uh, 16 plus years ago, the idea, and I had done some entrepreneurial things before that as well, the idea was really to help build something. It was a firm that already existed, but was entering a new era. So to me, the appeal of being an equity owner, um, of having influence over things over time, and whether it's being an equity owner or having some alignment of the future growth of the firm doesn't really matter as much to me as the ability to be creative and to be heard and to build something that's somewhat unique. And so I think a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, as you well know, Todd, are builders and they want to build something. They're not content with the status quo. They want to keep growing and building something. And I think that's really what interests me so much about this paradigm that now exists with the 4100 Group Financial Services or 4100 FS, we're in building mode. And I think we're doing it differently uh, than, than most other firms in our particular industry. And that's exciting. And that's, to me, what entrepreneurship is all about. Uh, again, doing things creatively and having the ability to keep moving forward instead of sticking with the status quo, being ahead of the curve, so to speak. Awesome. Awesome. So, so Rob, you've been a CEO, you've been uh, now managing principal, uh, you've been on boards, things like that. Uh, so what are some, 
common misconceptions that you've seen from both inside and outside the business, maybe as an advisor to them? What are some things that you see business owner that, that owners when they think, oh, this is how it's going to be, but it's not really like that? Yeah, I mean, there's there's things that are specific to our industry, but as a, a general rule, I think um, what's interesting to me is there's a lot of people that from the outside looking in, being an entrepreneur, um, you really have to roll up your sleeves and dig in because the responsibility is on you to make things happen. Not to say you don't necessarily have a team around you, but you surround yourself with the best people you can, but you still have to be able to uh, pivot. And uh, I heard a good story from somebody that I work with recently about a person who came into an entrepreneurial role and was completely stressed out. And I think the advice that my colleague gave them was, that's just another Tuesday. Don't take any of it too seriously. You've, you're going to have to juggle a lot of things with the idea of you're continuing to move forward. Your, your day is not going to be clearly defined. You know, you're going to have things come up depending on the, the situation you're in, you know, a small firm versus larger firm. But just you need to compartmentalize. You need to be organized. You need to roll through it. But being an entrepreneur means you need to be able to deal with a lot of different constituencies people, whether it be clients or your internal folks, um, a changing landscape in whatever industry you're in. So it's really to answer your question about rolling up your sleeves and every day is going to be an adventure, but that should be the fun part. Not everybody likes that. Um, but I think most of the people I'm surrounded by, uh, the people that work with me on a day-to-day -day basis thrive on that. And you need to ask yourself, you know, what, what is it that you enjoy because sometimes working for a large company can be a lot of fun and it can be the right environment, sometimes not. And it depends on your personality. I love what I do on a daily basis because no two days are the same. And as cliche as that sounds, but what keeps you moving and it keeps you moving to a place where you're ahead of the pack. Yeah, I love that, Rob. Thanks for sharing that. So, so I'm going to pivot and ask you a different question just because I think you have a different experience to share with some of our listeners. We've heard from uh, some private equity businesses in the past, and they've shared their experience and what it looks like to be on the private equity buyer side. Um, I have some private equity experience in my background where I was part of a portfolio company. I've also worked in a small family, in many small family businesses. You've got this, I want to talk a little bit about this family office and how you put it, you mentioned the word permanent, uh, almost like a permanent investor side. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that differentiates you and what you're doing in that business space to help our understanding? Our listeners understand that. Yeah, absolutely. So it's interesting. I, I kind of break it down, Todd, into two levels. So in terms of the 4100 Group Financial Services, you know, again, we call ourselves permanent capital. Um, we're not, you know, rolling up companies to go turn around and sell it at a higher multiple. We're looking to grow them um, for partners that want to grow something and, and be aligned with our growth and really move things forward. So we have the capital to do that, to invest in the financial services space. And I would say what differentiates us is wanting to build this ecosystem where there clearly is a, a, a synergy. I know it's an overworn word between the different facets to really support growth and additionally to support growth with a return on uh, investment type of mindset, you know, putting, putting money to work in the right ways, whether it be through uh, acquiring a company, partnering with a company, we're pretty flexible from a deal structure and a partnership perspective. That's one facet of it. And we're fortunate to have a group of people in the balance sheet to be able to really go after growth with a very specific set of, of rules and, and cultural uh, expectations in terms of trying to get to the next level of growth. Um, you know, the client first motto, especially in the registered investment advisory space is very important as fiduciaries, but there are a lot of different firms that approach things a lot of different ways and finding that fit can be more difficult than one might imagine. As it relates to specifically the family office concept, it's an interesting story. So Greece Financial Partner was founded in the late 70s by Sally Grease. It was the first female-owned registered investment advisor in the state of Ohio. And she's a tremendous person. She continues to be um, involved with the firm and uh, just an incredibly helpful resource. 
but she started it really for her family as a single family office. The, Cle- the Cleveland roots of the Grease family goes back to the early 19th century. It's a fascinating story, one that we probably don't have time to delve into deeply, deeply on this podcast. But um, so consequential wealth that was developed, multi-generational wealth. But when other people saw what she was doing pretty quickly, it became a multifamily office, other families with consequential wealth and desires to contribute to society by growing their wealth and, and putting the money back into the community through philanthropy and other things. So it became what's called a multifamily office or MFO. As time goes on, as you can imagine, we're now in fourth and fifth generation families. And so we're also serving, generally speaking, high net worth investors, small foundations, endowments, company 401k plants, things like that. With the wealth management piece, expanding that to a true multifamily office, um, you know, as, as Greece Financial Partners has evolved to becoming more of a high net worth practice, moving to a multifamily office that provides services, whether it be basic stuff like bill paying, uh, tax, estate planning, trust, that, that kind of things, you know, that, that really delved into the complexities of consequential wealth. We wanted to provide those services in addition to the investment piece, in addition to the financial planning, and all of that becomes kind of our, our separate multifamily office division. We just did an acquisition of a company that specializes in providing services to the ultra high net worth audience, but it doesn't stop there. It also expands to the full continuum of investment and wealth management. And so for us, our roots, Greece Financial Partners roots as a single and then multifamily office, we're now coming full circle back to that and providing even more comprehensive service delivery as another division within that, all under the heading of the 4100 Group Financial Services, which again, has the capital and the support, human capital as well, not just financial capital, to be able to help a multifamily office grow. Yeah, so I want to I want to just kind of summarize a little bit what I heard you say there. So in the family office space as an investor, the the f- couple of things that popped out at me is you're it's a cultural fit. It's not just a buy to buy. It's not a buy to resell. It's a I'm going to buy this and hold it as a long term investment. So you got to fit our culture. You got to fit what we're doing in the business overall, or it's not going to work out very well. That's not always the case in financial purchases, right? It's just looking for that growth wing. The second thing is, is that word permanent. I, that's a hard thing to understand, but you're becoming part of an investment portfolio that's going to hold for the long term. Now, maybe you do spin things off at times, but that's not the normal thing that you would do. There's a couple of things that I would hear you saying. Um, and the other thing that I heard a lot about was this need and desire to give back to the local community, right? These are families that have been blessed with extreme wealth through good decisions, good business management, good growth, good ideas, good entrepreneurship, all that stuff. And so they want to have a longer term opportunity to invest back into their communities, which is really cool. Those, those are some bullet points that I pulled out of it outside of the normal, hey, we buy businesses that we want to grow, if that makes sense. Yeah, Todd, you hit the nail on the head. Everything you're saying is exactly right. Starting with the point about permanent capital. You know, permanent is a strong word um, and maybe patient is the right way of saying it. But the reality is, is that we're not looking to turn around and sell these companies. We want to grow them. We benefit from the cash flow and the growth and how it fits into the broader ecosystem. Um, and incentives are aligned, even if someone sells their company. Sometimes people want to stick around and grow and, and benefit from that. Sometimes people are looking for a glide path to retirement. But either way, that fit um, is unlike most other private equity players, because ultimately, we're not looking to turn around and take something public or to sell it to somebody else at a higher multiple, we're looking to grow this thing and make it an attractive, for lack of a better term, annuity for us and for the seller. Um, and again, it may be that the seller or their team underneath them is, is looking to stay for a long period of time. Maybe in some cases they're not, but either way, incentives need to be aligned. And to your point about philanthropy, I mean, that's, a, and that started when Sally Grease founded the firm. Um, she has been deeply involved in the community. If you look at our leadership team and really everybody at Grease, deeply involved in the community, really committed to making a difference. And that flows up to the 4,100 financial services because we feel the same way. A lot of us came from Grease and take that same philosophy on being involved in the community. And part of that multifamily office division paradigm is philanthropic 
consulting. And that's really important because, as you mentioned, people with consequential wealth want to find the most effective way to give back. And part of our service offering is helping on that front. It's not only growing the net worth, that's obviously important. It's not only protecting it. It's not only making sure future generations are protected within a family or within a business, but it's also making sure there's a greater good element of this. And without fail, you know, I think the people that we hire and, and work with us and our clients feel the same way about that. Um, and, and, and it's exciting to be around that because that creates an energy on a lot of different fronts, whatever your philanthropic passion may be. There's a lot of ways to help in this world and not everybody takes the same approach. So that's not only impactful, but it also happens to be a lot of fun to see it in action. Yeah. Excellent, Rob. Thanks for sharing the details and the rest of that. So, so without sharing anything that um, I know uniquely 4100FS or anything like that, can you offer us a glimpse into the future of what you see for the business, the, the entity that you're part of today? What's it look like in the next three to five years? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a pretty amazing picture. Right now, um, we have about nine different deals across the verticals in our pipeline at varying stages of development. And let me give you some high level notes on what that looks like. It's continuing to do more in that multifamily office space we just talked about, which is not only service delivery, but it's also taking it to the next level in terms of the depth of complex wealth management, which includes investments, esoteric investments that really protect downside, have tax protection features. It's doing the appropriate financial planning and tax planning alongside that. And some of these acquisitions really feed into that multifamily office division we're building and what I think is somewhat unique. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, um, and everybody has a different approach as a firm, there are a lot of firms that have a couple of uh, super high net worth clients and sometimes need help in servicing those clients. So part of what we're doing in that space is not only serving clients or other single family offices directly, but also helping other registered investment advisors or even brokerage firms in serving those clients. It's a win-win because those advisors or those firms can um, more deliberately and intentionally service those clients with our support. And so that's one piece. We're looking at several acquisitions and partnerships and partnering with some pretty compelling people um, in that space. Uh, and so that's both organic and inorganic growth. We're obviously continuing to grow the, the core wealth management business. We kind of look at that sweet spot of smaller advisory firms, not exclusively so, at 250 million in assets under advisement or below, um, and building things deliberately, both in the Midwest and kind of creating a super regional player and in certain pockets of growth. Um, for example, in Florida, where many of our clients have migrated to over time, um, kind of a natural evolution. Um, and so we're doing a lot there. But what really excites me also is the way we can differentiate ourselves on the ancillary services side. And one example of that is we're in the process of looking at a very sophisticated accounting firm, really compelling service offering that provides best in class tax work. And unfortunately, there's a lack of sophisticated tax accounting that the demographics of the accounting profession, unfortunately, are not working in, in favor of, of the supply meeting demand uh, for any audience, but especially for uh, an audience that needs somewhat um, complex tax work done. So we're looking at bringing in a, a tax firm into our ecosystem and creating that continuum of services I referenced before. So when you put all that together, it's happening now already. We're growing a lot. Um, and the, the value of what we've done has grown significantly in the last couple of years. But I think to your point about the next three to five years, it will start to feed off of itself. And, but again, the cultural piece, bespoke service delivery, service intensity, we don't want to lose that. So we're willing to think about that in a somewhat different way than a lot of other private equity firms in that regard, because we're not just looking to maximize EBITDA um, over the next couple of years. We're looking to build something for the long haul. And I think it makes, makes it uh, more interesting because there's a lot of moving parts. It goes back to your first question about entrepreneurship. To do that well and to grow something you can be proud of, 
You need to keep thinking proactively about how do we do this, but never forgetting the core values that got you there. Excellent. Excellent. Love that. Thanks for filling in those blanks and sharing that future image. I, it, I'm excited to see what happens with your company over the coming years because you got a lot of moving parts coming together, it sounds like. We, we do. And it's, uh, it's really exciting. I love the questions you're asking, Todd, because they're thought provoking and remind me of uh, how excited I am about what we're building and, and where we're going from here. So I appreciate the, uh, the line of questioning. Well, feel free to share the recording with your the folks you work with. <laughs> Absolutely, we'll do. Uh, we just, you, you, we, you know I will. We, we just did a strategy session in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Right. So, so one final question for you, Rob, before we sign off. But what advice would you offer to uh, entrepreneurs today? Like, what, do you, what would you say to them and say, you know, what's the most important thing you've learned, seen, advice you've gotten? What would you share with others? Yeah, I, I think it's it's interesting because I talked earlier about experiences in my career. I didn't always love every second of every day, um, but use the earlier parts of your career, even if you're mid-career, to really take a step back and think about what you like doing on a daily basis and what you don't like doing. You know, take notes, write it down, keep a journal, whatever is easiest for you to think about and jot down those notes and really digest what is it that you like or don't like on a daily basis? It's too simplistic to only say follow your passion. That's a truism. Obviously, you want to do that. Everybody's in different family situations, financial situations. So you can't always follow your passion, but at least steer your passion towards what you like doing. And it may not happen overnight that you can have this job that is your dream job or dream startup or whatever you may want to be doing but it'll keep moving in the right direction. It took me a long time to figure that out. You don't necessarily need to chase the brand name of a company or the next role. Be deliberate. Think about on a daily basis what you enjoy and really map out where you want to be five years down the road. And it's not exactly a straight line path. Nothing's ever completely linear. But I think there's a quote, and I'll butcher the quote, that you need to keep reaching for the stars. You may not get them, but you won't end up with a handful of mud either. And I think that's the key. You want to get to the right place and it takes time and patience, but you'll keep moving in that right direction and it'll make you happier personally and professionally. Love it. Thanks, Rob. That's great advice. Great advice. So Rob, thank you again for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and learning more about 4100 FS uh, as well as really candidly what a family office is and what you do as part of that. Uh, so great meeting you and learning more about your business. And thank you to everyone that watches and listens. We look forward to uh, hearing from you and listening to you and watching you on the next episode of On It, Not In It. Thanks again, Rob. Thank you, Todd. Pleasure to be with you. Yeah, have a great day. Thank you.